never thought we'd get to this age. I mean, is there anyone else in here remotely near my kind of age zone? <laughs> You're lying. No, no way, don't be that tall. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> so I was, thinking, I was looking back at my life and I was thinking, it was, um, the, the, the whole thing about when you get to 53, and as every year goes past, you start thinking more and more about how the hell you got here. How the hell did I get to Cork on my 53rd birthday? And I guess for me, it's, it's, uh, it goes back to punk rock, because everything goes back to punk rock. And I was thinking about the times when I was growing up in Blackpool when I was younger. And I, was, I don't know if anybody here has actually been to Blackpool. Yeah. yeah. It's like a really beautiful, the people who haven't been here, I kind of describe it as really beautiful seaside resorts in the United Kingdom. The people who have been there know I'm totally lying about that. Yeah. <laughs> so we was growing up there in the 1970s, and uh, the music that we're really into was uh, glam rock. And that was one of the kids. And I know everyone's completely rewritten the history of the 70s now, this idea that there was no music and there was no culture before punk rock came along. Which is, which is it's kind of weird when you read that, because if you're my age, you think, well, there's a lot of good stuff happening, wasn't there? And it's, for us, because we were like kids, we were 12, 13, it was the glam thing. And the glam thing is also, for me, a bit wider than just uh, David Bowie, who's, who's a genius, who's fantastic. And I always think, when people talk about the night, people say to me, what's the history of the 1960s? You just say, well, just go listen to the Beatles, you kind of get an idea of how the history went. If you want to know the history of the 70s, then you miss uh, David Bowie. But that didn't mean he had the whole story, because for me, I like Mark Bowler better, and I thought he was far better. But nobody at school would ever say that, would they? Because I don't know if you're my kind of age, so admitting you like Mark Bowler at school before about 1975, you'd probably get battered for doing it. Because Blackpool was a very straight-laced town, probably unlike Cork, which I imagine was a very liberal place in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. See, I, I know that's true because I've been here before, like a long, long time back. So, so about the kind of place Blackpool you went to school, if you said you wanted to like, do anything arty or be a poet or something, that was like puffy, you know, that was the word. Are you a puff or what? So you always have to pretend you have no kind of artistic inclinations at all. But the thing about it, back in England, and it's probably in a sense probably true in Ireland as well, the, the artistic stuff comes out in, in loving music, and I think that's one of the things that, one of the things that completely got me hooked into music in the first place. It was a space to be slightly different, and also, if you felt arty, you could say, I'm not going to write poetry, I'm just going to write music, and it's different because they're lyrics, they're not poems, and that's, that was kind of something, I don't know really how that was okay to write lyrics instead of poems. But going back to the 70s, there was this thing, so I was down to Glam Rocks, so we were watching Top of the Pops every week, and there's always like, and this kind of lasted about 10 years, there's always this moment, there's like a, one great band in every programme, even right to the punk period, it's about 1980, there's always that moment when one of your bands got onto the programme, and your parents looked a bit awkward and a bit embarrassed, and there'd be somebody dressed up in baker foil, with like silver hair, or something, singing, and, and it'd be a really great song. My favourite band that period was uh, uh, Mott the Hoople. I don't know if anybody here is old enough to know Mott the Hoople at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely fantastic band. And I don't know if anybody went to see their Reformation last year, but they were as good now as they were in the 70s. And uh, after the gig, I, 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 I met Ian Holt, and I met him a couple of times, and he's a really good guy. And they're really uh, precursors to punk rock, a proto-punk band. That's what we call them in journalism, because we have these kind of words in journalism we use all the time. Journalistic cliches, proto-punk is one of them. It means a punk band before punk that don't really look like a punk band. But they, they sat here and wrote really fantastic lyrics, you know, about, you know, kind of street lyrics, but not but poetry as well. It's poetic as Bob Dylan, but they're about rainy day England, which was great. He came from Shrewsbury, like Maria does this. So when we go to Maria, he's always walked down the street, he came from, which is it Swan Hill or Swan Hill, yeah, that's, he wrote a song about that. And I love that thing then, rock and roll iconography, and you go to places and you think that's where that person came from, that's where that gig happened. And that kind of thing's always really fascinating if you're really deep into pop culture. So it was not the Hoople, so after, after the game we went uh, backstage and um, over there Watts is there, it's like the legendary bass player of the Hoople and he's, apparently he's, he's meant to be really grumpy, you don't speak to over there. and he stood in the corner on his own and I, and I went up to him and I, I, I said, over there Watts, when we grew up, you think, you think so fantastic because he's the first guy to wear stack heel boots and I, I think if you're under 50 that means absolutely nothing at all, but the idea of wearing these thigh length plastic red stack heel boots, it, and, I don't, I just must sound completely insane now, but that looked really cool when you were 13. And he had silver hair. But they were so British. It was like, you know, like American bands when they have silver hair, they've got, it's like a 600 quid haircut. 
this is like this guy to get silver hair. He got car spray spraying his hair silver. It was like British wrestlers in the 1960s. You know, they had their sequins stitched on by the mothers, didn't they? You know, they and the Americans had like these really posh outfits, and that's why American wrestling is basically crap. Wasn't it? But the British wrestling in the 70s was somehow really brilliant, like kind of really fat blokes who shouldn't really be fighting each other. In a sense, that's what British glam rock was like as well. American glam rock was Kiss, who was like the worst band of all time. They were appalling. British glam rock was bands like Mott the Hoople, were just like an amazing band. So I went to Over and Watts and said, Over here, I know, I know you're a bit of a grumpy stuff, but I've just got to shake your hand. And it turned out he's like a totally nice bloke, and he completely caught me out here because he goes, and he's got, I can't do a Wurzel accent, he's from Hereford. But he goes, he goes Oh, fuck me, John Rock for the membranes. And I thought that's, that, that's for me, was the coolest moment of my life. I was recognised by Over M. Watts. And we had a really good long chat about music. He's really into underground music. So, it's for, so for him to be into the membranes wasn't like a one off thing. He was just going about those kind of weird little bands that he really liked because he's a big fan of the John Peel show and he listens to John Peel all the time. I thought, wow, this guy's still in touch with music. Is, is he? He even started emailing all these young bands. He was, he was thinking, check this band out, check that band out. I think you don't even need to do this anymore. You're about 70 now. And he had a great pair of shoes on. Again, go back to the homemade British wrestling thing. He had these kind of white shoes on. One shoe, he'd felt tipped on, I'm A. And on the other shoe, he had a wanker. <laughs> just, just, a, just a totally cool guy. And I said, um, so it must be, after 25 years, it must be really difficult to get a band back together. All that rehearsing, it must be really tricky. He said, rehearsing? No, we just went, we just did the first gig, and they hadn't even rehearsed. I mean, obviously, by the time we got to the London gig, we'd done seven gigs, but the first gig we played, like a little low key gig, he just turned up, he said, I got my bass out the cellar, haven't touched it for years, and just played the gig. I thought, ah, he just rules, it's fantastic. So if they reform again, which hopefully they will do, but they're getting older and older, because Ian Hunter now is 74, 75, something like that. So they, they are, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm running out of time at 53, but they're running out of time at that age, but Hunter looks exactly the same. If he's, He's a bit like Wilco, you know, indestructible, because, you know, Wilco, as we all know, has it's, it's got the, uh, the terminal cancer, but Wilco, that was, it should have been dead in three months, and it's 18 months ago, the totally indestructible Wilco Johnson. The way I interviewed, the great pleasure of interviewing this event I did last year, I did this event at Manchester, a music and books event, uh, called Out of Words, and it's, it's probably best, I've done quite a lot of these in conversations, you know, it's like you interview another person on the stage. I interviewed Will Cole, it's, it's the best one I've ever done, he's just like, he's, he's so like, he's a very smart guy. And he doesn't come over like that, he comes over as a typical rock and roll, I don't know who talks like that, but he's not, and he's not, and it's like, you think, maybe he's not got a lot of words, I've got to fill in for him a bit when I do the interview, but you ask him, he can talk about anything, he's really into astronomy, which is great, that's, that's, that's a cool thing to be into. And then he's, um, he's also like, he's a, I knew we'd been to university and you'd been an English teacher, so I thought that's quite interesting, that's a really weird route to go from, somebody went from university to an English teacher, to be a, a guitarist in one of the greatest bands of the bit that came just after glam, uh, glam rock and just before punk rock. And, and, and this guy was very gruff, you know, and of course everyone knows Wilco's like, you know, like that, and he's like staring eyes, speed freak, even when he's not on the speed, he looks like he's speeding. I mean, he's, he's, he's like, he's somebody's built for speed. I mean, we all know who he is, he's got the bug eyes and expressions. So we talk about, I said, well, what did you do at university, Wilco? What subjects did you take? Was it English? He said, well, I went to university. You had to do two subjects in English. You taught old American or old English. I didn't want to do one of those fucking things. So what I did was old Icelandic. I said, old Icelandic? What the hell was that? And I said, he'd, done, he'd read all the Icelandic um, the books and the myths books and he'd done it in old Icelandic. So he had to learn old Icelandic, which no one speaks anymore. I said, well, Carl, you can pull in my leg. And he got up and he spoke to the crowd about old Icelandic. And I, he could have been fibbing because no one there would know what old Icelandic sounded like. But it definitely sounded a bit like old Icelandic. So there you go, Wilco Johnson, the greatest guitar player uh, just before punk, is could speak old Icelandic and knows all the Norse legends. And that's one of the great things you find out about rock and roll. But anyway, back to glam rock. So we watch uh, the Top of the Pops every week, which is the superb conduit to music. And, uh, so, so I was getting into all the other stuff, like the Sweet, Sweet makes some great singles, didn't they? I never liked the albums, and I never liked many of the songs they wrote themselves. I know you meant to say you liked their own stuff, but Jim Chapman wrote their songs and wrote a lot of the glam stuff, a fantastic uh, right, this kind of stomping, you know, like that kind of, see, that's meant to make it an echoey stomping sound, which is a little clacking sound. This stage is solid. You know, it's just not hollow, is it? So, so but it, it's, stomping is standard feature, like Slay were fantastic as well, weren't they? Just like, it's terrorist music, football hooligan music, and, but also Slay are really brilliant songs. And I interviewed Nolly Holden once as well, and he's a really, really cool guy. Again, really smart guy. And, and when, he when he talks, he talks like he sings, he's got that voice. And he's not precious about it at all. So you can say, the first thing you do after you go, right, 
Noddy. I mean, you have to call him Noddy, which is quite weird, but calling him Neville would be weird, wouldn't it? So you go, all right, Noddy, uh, we'll ask, oh, let's do the interview. For about two questions, you go, Noddy, can you do the baby, baby, baby thing? And he'll do it for you. You know, they begin to go, baby, baby, baby. See, I can almost do a Midlands accent then, we've got that. So you can do that really loud as well, it's got one of the loudest voices I've ever heard. So, so and that was great because we'd grown up with Slade, and, and Slade completely didn't care how stupid they looked, and, and that made them look be better in a sense, because they were not that bothered about, not hamstrung by cool. Because the great thing when you look at all those 70s glam bands, apart from Mark Bowling, who always thought effortlessly cool, even Bowie didn't really look that cool in some of these pictures. I mean, I guess he must be cool to pull off some of those looks. I mean, the Ziggy look is amazing, you know, it's out of space and that. But at the same time, it's actually like pretty, pretty mad looking, like a knitted, crocheted pair of hot pants. It's like, if anyone else wore that, it would look, they'd get run out of town, wouldn't they? But Bowie pulled it off because he really looked like an alien. And I remember seeing, when you saw a picture of me a kid, and this is what I was sort of getting round to on the punk rock thing. This idea that when 73, 74, you think, I want to make music, but how, how can I, some like stupid, like, bumpkin, because we're bumpkins in Blackpool, really, and we can't make music, which is what people in London do. And that's what we thought. We thought it was so unattainable, so far away, that we could never do it ourselves, you know. And, with, and when you look at people like Bowie, they look like they came from outer space, and that was even further than London, although London actually felt it was further than outer space in those days. <laughs> Because you always get t a TV programs in Britain about how great London was and what people in London do. And, and even Manchester didn't even get mentioned. I mean, Manchester didn't exist for about 19... Well, until after Punk, you know, Punk put all these British kind of like provincial cities. That's the one of the word in it, provincial. Like, we're still provinces of their empire, which is quite weird. You got out, you escaped, but we're still trapped in London's empire. So, so we had all this kind of thing um, going on. Like, it's an unattainable culture. It's just like... The, the record, the seven inch singles, which is the purest and most brilliant form of pop music, it's one song shot in it. And they're like handed down from the gods to you, you listen to it and you put the B side on the B side of it, especially T Rex be as good as the A side. And that was great, and that was enough, and that's enough for most people. But for some of us who wanted to do, uh, do it ourselves, and when the punk thing started coming, there was that sense of that, that there, was a, there was a culture you could to join in with. Well, first, we didn't even hear the music at first. I mean, I was starting to buy the music papers about 73, 74. God, that sounds ridiculous now, doesn't it? It's like, it's like going to the British Museum and looking at tablets from uh, Assyria from like 5000 BC. And when you actually look at the old music papers, it's like that. And I don't know if anybody else keeps all their old music papers, and I keep quite a few of them. But you, do you have that thing when you look at an article from 42 years ago and you actually can remember the whole article from the first sentence? That's really sad, isn't it? That's kind of getting into like really kind of autistic territory, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But if this kind of stuff really sticks in your head, like all the chart positions of the bands, that's another thing I can always remember for like 15 years, you can remember like where all their records went to. And I don't even want to remember that at all. I'm, I'm not even interested in that. It just sticks in my head. So I can, I know all like, the Hoople's chart positions. It's the most useful thing. I think. That's why that's why I'm still here talking to you and not doing a proper job, isn't it? Because I can remember <laughs> crap like that. So, so, so punk cuts start coming along. The first kind of notion of what punk was, and this is pre-Bill Grundy, and it's like, we weren't punks at all, we were just kids who were dead into music. And we sort of saw the pictures of the, of the punk bands and, um, in the music papers, and we just thought, wow, dude, they look so cool, you know? And you could tell what they sound like from what they look like, because I don't, this kind of a thing people at certain age will remember, but after Glam Rock, there was, definitely it was a gap of about 18 months, well, apart from Dr. Feelgood, where nothing much really happened, and, and people started wearing lots of denim, and that's okay, you know, it's clothes are clothes and that, but the music sat, started to sound like lots of denim. And it's bands like Smokey with the biggest band in the country. Does anybody remember Smokey at all? They're about four massive hits. Weren't actually that bad a band. He's got a kind of good croaky voice. Chris Norman the singer, I think it was. But it wasn't that exciting, was it? It wasn't like, that wasn't music to be 15 to. Then you start seeing pictures of the punk bands. And, and I was completely sold, even before I even heard the music. Because it wasn't like now you just go to YouTube or SoundCloud or on the internet. You can find everything really, really quickly, which, which is great. But then it was like, to, to hear stuff, it was a quest, wasn't it? Especially for in Blackpool. So when Anarchy in the UK came out, people couldn't get that record, you know, it's, it, you could probably, people had to go to Manchester to buy records, it was like, it, it, it was even more unobtainable culture, but you kind of knew what was coming, and what I always thought was really fascinating about punk, bad punk, is that you knew what it sounded like from what the people looked like, you could see the intensity in their look, especially in Johnny Rotten's there, I remember that classic picture there, uh, Johnny Rotten from 1976, I think it's in Record Mirror of all papers, he's got his head tilted side, he's got really short spiky hair, and he's staring at the camera, Again, the speed freaks there. And it looks amazing, and we're completely sold on it then. For, no matter what these sound like, we love this band, you know. It, it took ages to get around here, and the first time I actually heard the Sex Pistols is the least punk rock environment you could possibly imagine. 
We've grown in Blackpool, there's nowhere to go. It was like there wasn't even youth clubs or anything. You couldn't get the pubs. We couldn't even get the pubs, we were old enough to get the pubs because it was all for holiday makers, it wasn't for people who had funny haircuts, etc. So we had to go ice skating, and that's where you would hang around in the because that's where the 16 year olds went. So, but it was scary, and it's classic Blackpool. And it needs to have it. And, like, you wouldn't actually you can't put the skates on, it's pathetic, in it? And you can't lean on the side hoping you'd have to skate. And they had this thing called the Mad Dash at midnight where everybody went around really fast. And, and the really hard schools, because everyone every kind of went into their school and said, it wasn't like in a school uniform, but if you were on one school or another school, they were going to hang around together. And the hard school would go around and push everyone over and kick them in the head with the skates. So they got patches of blood on the ice. <laughs> I don't know what was over the 70s. I don't, I mean, I don't, people just didn't know how to have fun, did they? It was just like, it was all, everything was about violence everywhere you went, wasn't it? So even, even the sodding ice skating was violent, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm going to like watch Blackpool matches, it was totally violent and totally scary all the time. I mean, and that wasn't the way fans, that was the Blackpool fans fighting each other. You know, when the way fans turned up, they just watched the Blackpool fans all scrapping each other. So, and also the way fans will come to Blackpool and like, you play Huddersfield. I mean, Huddersfield, I don't know if anyone's been to Huddersfield. It's a nice town, but it's not very big, is it? But they bring about 18,000 people to Blackpool, and the Blackpool have about 6,000 so It's like, Jesus Christ, like a herd of them coming towards you with their, with their this is about 977 we jumped forward a little bit, but they have feather cuts, um, donkey jackets, a big like, blue uh, flare denims on, which everyone else kind of got past that stage because everyone's into pop rock by then. And they come up with like 20,000 of them, it's like loads and loads and loads of them. And eventually you find one that was a bit more, um, less hyped up, a bit more like human in a sense. And we say, well, what's up with you guys? I didn't realise all these people were so popular. And they go, oh no, it's a, it's a, it's a weekend out, Blackpool's, the whole family were come. And they go down to Blackpool and beat us all up and go out for a drink in town. So we're always numerically disadvantaged by people coming for their little uh, weekend break to Blackpool for a touch of football hooganism. But that was, to me, that was essentially just it was, it was a supremely violent period. I know, I know violence didn't go out of fashion, it still carries on. But people, people actually go out and have fun now. You know, it's kind of weird when you go to gigs. People have a good time, don't they? Because I remember the punk era, we go to gigs and we always have to go to Lancaster because Blackpool had very few punk gigs. So Lancaster University had the gigs on. And there used to be a massive fight between Blackpool, Preston, and Morecambe Punks. And, it, and the Morecambe Punks used to always win the fight. And I don't know if ever, has anyone ever been to Morecambe in here? Yeah. Yeah. How, where are these people? You know, you go to Morecambe, you think, <laughs> what, happened to, what happened to the Morecambe psycho punks? Did they all die? And they probably did, or did they move somewhere else? It's, it's the most sleepy nowhere place ever, really. You can't imagine it being, you know, the gig that everyone stood there, and you know, like the Romans going, and it's going, yeah, they're Romans. And then some go, the Morecambe Punks are here. And then we go, oh my god, the Morecambe Punks are here. And then everyone like, really shit themselves because the Morecambe Punks are turned up. It sounds ridiculous. You'd think Blackpool would have the hardest crew, wouldn't it? Because it's the biggest town, or Preston, because it's kind of a bit more industrial. But no, it was Morecambe. And that, that, was, that was the terror of the North West at the time. <laughs> And I remember like about 1978 actually, there was a great buzzcock sting in Blackpool, but that was marred by violence. But this was like Morecambe v Preston v Blackpool, Punks v Skinheads. And we just stood there going, well, what do we do? We don't want to fight. We're, not, we're small and young there. We're about 16 at the time. It's hard to remember. It's hard to uh, think of us being 16, but we were. And we stood there just kicking off everyone. Everyone was hiding behind the PA. Like, <laughs> it, was like, it was like watching clips of like, some kind of civil war in Europe or something. It was only a punk rock game. People took it so damn seriously. I mean, the music's weren't taken seriously with the violence, God's sake. But the best thing was, like, so it's all kicking off everywhere. And everyone's fighting. It was like, everyone's getting punched in the face and that. The Pete Shelley goes up to Mike and he goes, he goes, hey, you see, Sandy's, stop fighting for your Uncle Peter. And, so, and I don't know how it worked, but everyone looked so ashamed. <laughs> they stopped fighting, they stood there like that, and they just carried on. And, all, and I met Pete Shelley, and he remembers that gig as well. He remembers being stumped. He didn't really know what to do because he wasn't like, um, it wasn't like a, like that, like a clash, a band that was built for riots or the stranglers, with a bass player that caused riots. This is like a band, was, these are like genuinely really nice people. They weren't fighting bands, but Pete Shelley, Stop the fighting in that gig that night, and so shook his hand for it. He probably saved our lives or whatever. So, so this punk thing's come on the horizon, and um, and it, what the most fantastic thing about punk rock is it's kind of sense and power when you go out of it. So, so this idea you could join in was great. So initially, it wasn't really like that. So it's like, but the bands are talking about it a bit where you read Sex Plus interviews, and John Lydon would say, I want more bands, more bands. And that was kind of the story. So you go, well, we can't do it. We're up in Blackpool. He's, he's going to. It's not going to help us at all, you know, we can't form bands, we can't play anything. But then somebody at uh, school, there's two things that happened at school. Somebody brought a copy of Sniffing Glue, the punk fanzine to school. And it was amazing, it was like, it was all handwritten, and little bits of typing in it. And obviously whoever, well, whoever I say whoever, because at the time for whoever was making this, it was obviously Mark Perry. But um, we thought, he just made this himself, this is fantastic. We, my mate's dad was a printer, 
And he said, you can make you just go to photocopy and go, what's a photocopy? And you know, because this is what you've got to remember about British punk rockets is utter naivety. And when I wrote that my dear punk book, your history punk, this is what I found out, it's, it's great because people were only about two or three years older than we were. And this just people just didn't know what to do, they just went and did stuff. And I looked at the American punk scene, New York punk scene, which is a fantastic punk scene, but it's very, very different. Like all the bands were like four or five years older, much more worldly wise. I mean, you know, like there's people like, like Didi Limon, God bless him, and Johnny Thunders and people like that. And these are people, heroin addicts, whose girlfriends are prostitutes. And da -da -da. It was the rock and roll myth, it was Keith Richards times a million. But, but in England, no one's like that. There's, I mean, you interview people like Subway Sex, who like part of the initial punk scene. And they used to go see the sex business and cycle there and put their bicycle clips in their pockets. And that's, that's what I was thought, that's got really stuck in my head because it kind of summed up the British punk scene in all ways. I don't know if anybody saw that really great film at uh, Christmas when the sex business played that uh, Christmas gig at Huddersfield. Yeah. It's the best punk film ever. And it's, that to me sums up punk more than anything else. All the theories, all the bullshit, all the rewriting the story. When you watch that gig, to me, that sums up what punk's about. It's just the sex business is just four very young kids, really. 19, 20, 21. Played this gig, the last gig they played in the original lineup, and it was a benefit Christmas party for the fire, striking firemen in, uh, in Huddersfield, back to Huddersfield again for some reason. And these kids, they had no money, they had no Christmas dinner, so they provided it all for them. And it's an amazing gig, and then even they played that like, proper Christmas gig in a place called Ivanhoe's, which sadly now is, is like a, it's a horrible kind of supermarket thing. I went there a few months ago to do a picture of it, back to look at the rock and roll and I can walk through buildings again. But the naivety of the band was so great, it was like, there's a, they made a little cake for the kids, and Rotten got the cake, and he's throwing it around the room, and smashed it in his face, and Sid's dancing with the little kids, and it's, I think it's, it's such a, a beautiful scene, and I'm thinking, what made me think was uh, how revolting the establishment of Britain was at that time. The, the, the establishment which was tarred the sex pistols, the Antichrist, you know, they all play the records on the BBC, and all that kind of thing. And then you're thinking, who was the BBC at the time? Who was their number one DJ at that time? It was Jimmy Savile, wasn't it? And then, you know, they're, they're saying the Sex Pistols are, are the destroyers of civilization. And then, you know, you, you remember that time in the summer of 77, Rotten got his face slashed and Paul Cook got beaten up in the street and all this kind of thing was going on. But they were just, I'm not thinking, they were just kids, you know. And the people who were actually like banning their records were vile people. It's like, it sort of twists the story back to front and it makes you realise that. The controversy of punk was, it was, it was the purity of punk that made it controversial. The establishment hated the way that these people were incorruptible. I know Sid got corrupted in the end, but at least he corrupted himself, he didn't corrupt anybody else. And the, the people actually running the whole thing, not all of them, but a lot of them, were just the horriblest people ever, weren't they? And punk was like a, it was a line in the sand, it was like rock and roll just gone so out of control that somebody had to get in. So you can't do stuff like that, you can't behave like that. But that's not, that's not a narrative you ever get in the band of sex pieces, you just go, oh, you know, they spat everywhere, they were sick everywhere, and Sid killed himself with heroin. And it's not the real story to me. They, they're like a really articulate, intelligent, and dangerous band, dangerous establishment, because they reflect the establishment right back at themselves. And that's like a really fantastic thing. And that's inspiring. Even at the time, we got, we got a feeling that's what, that's, this is what's a story. You know, there was something far darker going on up there than there was with the band. Plus, they're one of the greatest rock and roll bands ever. Because Malcolm McLaren was um, a brilliant manipulator genius, but luckily he also had the best band of that period, who have now written out the punk story, but it's much like the clash. Without the sex business, none of this would have happened. You know, we, we, we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be doing this. Maybe we found something better to do, but we wouldn't be doing this. So, so the pistols like kind of fire over real into this punk thing. Well, nobody knew what punk was, we didn't know what punk was. It's, we were Blackpool, so how do you work out what punk is? There's no template for it. I know the Daily Mirror would have these articles, punks have to do this and that, here's 20 things, you must have seen the clippings, here's 20 things punk do, punks do. But of course, we thought that was the way I was even then, but we didn't even know what punk was, we still thought it was funny. But then all things very, very different. So, in, in London, people, the punk thing would be, people would get money, go to a uh, sex shop, and sex shop clothes are amazing, like works of art, but they're really expensive, they're like, they're like designer clothes, they're like the highest end designer clothes. And, uh, but in the North, it wasn't like that, people, people would wear like, Oxfam was a godsend for us. It was getting stuff in Oxfam. It was getting jackets like this, and that was like what we're wearing inside out. Not stupid things, but things to actually make a statement. Wearing your tie, really tight or something. Cutting your hair, trying to spike your hair up. I don't know if anybody can remember how hard that was, because now you just go get hair products, don't you? But then it's like, how 
to make your hair stand up, but then it's like, try everything. Coffee, so we'll say, try coffee. So we put coffee on our hair. And, so, and then, of course, it rained, didn't it? And the rain and the coffee just kind of poured down your face and everything. <laughs> Skin your eyes. And then, then, then somebody goes, no, 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 it's soap. That's how you do it. So it's soap go in there. And that will really rain, because it does rain a lot now and then. And the rain, and, it, and that will get in your eyes as well. Then somebody found Vaseline. And for a few years, Vaseline was a king for that kind of stuff. And then, then a few years after that, somebody said, why, why are you just using hair grease? And go, oh, God, why didn't you think that in the first place? The most obvious thing, a two-pound tin of hair grease to make hair stand on end. So, so it's all, it's all so it, this is like a, if there's no template, and that's the beauty of the initial punk thing. There's no idea what punk actually was. So, so that's why, the first wave of bands are all completely different from each other. I quite like I, mean, I like the second wave of bands just because of the pure aggression and anger of it, because the early eighties was a much more angry period. But the late seventies it was an art school thing where it started. But the way it affects people is in completely different ways. And I like the way that um, bands like Suicide from New York felt like a punk band, even though they formed in nineteen sixty nine and the and the music was just like, you know, keyboard to the machine and somebody singing and that, that was it. I and mean, that's not what people think of punk as, but you could feel the, the, the danger of that band, you know, the first time you heard the records and the way they ended up killed when they supported the clash and so it bottles up and made this love of them even more, you know, thought they were an ace band. But the, the diversity of that all the way across the Ramones, all the way across the clash, the Buzzcocks, Travelers, Pistols, none of those bands sound similar at all. And that was a beautiful initial punk thing. It was like people feeling their way around, they didn't quite know what it was. So they're all three kind of a different version of it. It's, it's tainted and affected by very, very different things. There's, um, so, so, what, so Smithy Blue came to school, and that inspired us to do some writing. Because we saw this thing, it's a fancy. So we've got an old typewriter, start typing, stuck the template down. Went to photocopy, photocopied some fancy. So I did a fancy called Rocks, which is a rubbish title, but it's like Blackpool Rocks, as in, hey, the pun. That's it, Blackpool Rock, Blackpool Rocks. You know, we were 16, you know. And we just cut things up. And we did, also, we quite to Spike Milligan's books. You know, he used to do those little cartoons, his books of speech balls and stuff like that. He, and because he's caught on, on, a, on a kick, on our kick, this Sunday afternoon. So, so we really into what he was doing as well, uh, for before punk, this kind of stuff he grew up with. So that was all kind of mixed in there. We did our own little fancy, and that's how I learned to be a writer. I mean, it's pretty obvious if I've had no training in being a writer. You just, you just write the stuff down. And the, what I find ended up in the music paper is I realised there's two schools of writing. The people have been to uh, college to learn how to write, so if you do it properly, they could do punctuation. And all, they, they knew where commas went and stuff like that. And if anyone's read my website, you realise that I'm still struggling with that concept. <laughs> the comma is a confusing thing. The little dash. Because I, I, I don't think people, people don't talk in sentences in grammar, do they? Everyone kind of talks in half grammar, kind of big splurges of information. Well, people in music do anyway. You know, the best, the best communication, I think, in music is just people just going, oh, God, it's so great. How do I articulate this? And it just comes out in a rush. And I love that kind of writing. So, when, when, say, a 16 year old kid sends something to the website and say, I can't write properly, they go, Of course you can write. I mean, I'm still in that punk school where people say, I can't sing, I hate that idea. Everyone could sing, everyone, everyone could do everything, because that's the power that I got from punk. So, somebody brought Stiff and Blue, and that power is to be writers, and I edit our own fancies. We wrote about the local scene. There was quite a weird, weird, quite a few bands come up in Blackpool that kind of period. And I think the next thing inspired us was the uh, Buzzcock Spiral Scratch EP. So, somebody brought that to school, and it had a kind of very obviously photocopied sleeve. And it was very homemade looking as well. We thought you can make your own records. And that, that was just completely revolutionary. This idea you can make your own records. Because in the 70s, like I was saying, music seems to come from the gods. It was like something you couldn't just um, you couldn't just go and make a record. So we, so we tried. We tried to make a record. We just got a few local bands. I mean, luckily in town, there's a slightly older band called Section 25. And then you were, uh, and they were Factory Records, a really great band. And then you were a recording studio was in Rochdale. So we went down there. It was a night session. We never stayed up. Oh, no, only 17 at that time. We stayed about four in the morning, you know, parties and that. But nobody ever stayed until eight o'clock the next morning. So about seven in the morning, so we record our track to you seven eight in the morning. And the drummer's getting tired towards the end, so it slows down towards the end. As like a lot of records then were like, really, because nobody actually knew anything about keeping time and stuff like that. In fact, I just remember that when we did our first ever gig, about six months before that, we didn't really know um, how to tune guitars. I mean, that was the other thing. There's no one to ask. The old musicians town wouldn't really help you. So we thought tuning guitars, you pull the machine heads in a row, get them to the end, put them in a row. So of course, if you play the first chord, they just go plong. It's just completely out of tune. So we played like that for about 10 minutes in a Northern Soul Club in Kirkham, in Blackpool. And all the Northern Soulies want to beat us up in the 70s, want to beat you up. It's like the way it is. So we had to go a quick exit out there. 
There's a pom I don't like who put a pom gig on in a little soul club in a little town in Lancashire, but it's not a very good idea. So that was the first gig. We took us ages. Then we never learned any chords about five years because we didn't know there was such a thing as chords. We just make them up to a bunch of guitar player, but it's finger there, finger there. That sounds good. And we just make, make the bass line and fit it together. So it's all kind of wonky and out of shape. But it kind of worked to us. In the end, we kind of find it to weird fine art. And there's so many people of my age, my generation, right? they've never actually learned 